You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Today's episode is brought to you by Beer 52, the most popular craft beer discovery club. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. On Sunday, the 27th of May, 1974, 20-year-old Barbara Forrest had a great day. Together with her boyfriend, 21-year-old Simon Belcher, they led the service at St. Mark's Church. Simon was standing in for his father, who was the minister of the church. Barbara was a youth worker at the church. Everyone enjoyed the service as it was lovely to see the young couple working together. After the service, they decided to go out for a night on the town, as the following day was Whit Monday, a bank holiday. They went dancing and then visited a couple of pubs in Hansworth and Birmingham City Center. Simon walked her to the Colmore Circus bus stop in Birmingham at 1 a.m., where Barbara waited for the number 67 bus. He said goodbye and jumped onto his own bus and headed home to Mosley in the opposite direction. Barbara lived by herself in an apartment in Erdington. The bus ride from Colmore Circus to Tyburn was a 20-minute bus ride. Then... She still had a 10-minute walk to get home. Erdington was a safe area, and Barbara had no reason to fear for her safety. When Barbara did not show up at her work on Tuesday morning, co-workers at the Pipe Hayes Children's Home tried to reach her at her home, but there was no answer on the phone. Barbara worked at the children's home as a nurse and was very reliable. It was very unusual for her not to notify them if she could not make it into work. Barbara's family notified police, and the search for the well-loved 20-year-old was on. Pamphlets were distributed, and everyone from their church and community helped look for Barbara, desperately hoping that she had left on her own volition. On the 4th of June, eight days after she was last seen alive, the worst was confirmed. Barbara Forrest's body was discovered in the grass of Pipe Hayes Park, a short distance from her home. She had been raped and strangled and left half-naked, covered with foliage in a ditch off the busy Chester Road. Who could have committed such a heinous murder, and why? Soon after, police opened their investigation into Barbara's murder. They found another murder case, with so many similarities, it could not be ignored. The strange thing, however, was that the other murder was committed 157 years before Barbara was killed. What was going on? In 1817, Erdington was a small town outside the big bustling town of Birmingham. It was a working-class village with small cottages and a couple of pubs. The mainly Catholic community was made up of large families, and everyone knew each other. The most significant industry was Penn's Mill, owned by the Webster family. It was a large farm estate that also held a wire factory. Most of the men from Erdington used to work there, but as it was a time of hardship, many men had been laid off. In order to secure an income, many people took jobs farther afield. To get to work, they walked long distances, regardless of the weather. Ernington was a place of early risers, milkmen and milkmaids, farmers, barge operators and peddlers. 20-year-old Mary Ashford's family had lived in the Ernington area for many generations, and most people in town knew Mary. She was friendly and sprightly, and always open to conversation. Mary was well-liked in the community, and many men were keen on her. But although she enjoyed the attention, she had a good moral compass. It did not go around with men, saving herself from marriage. Mary worked as a housemaid on the farm of her uncle John Coleman. It was the small farm at Langley Heath, about three miles from Erdington. Mary helped her uncle on the farm, too, and sold his dairy products at the market in Birmingham. 
The morning of Sunday, the 26th of May, 1817, was no exception. She left Erdington for Birmingham, where she set up her stall in the usual spot outside of the Castle Inn. It was the day before Whit Monday, and with spring making the days brighter and warmer, there was a festive feeling to the day. After her day's work, Mary visited her best friend, Hannah Cox. Mary and Hannah grew up together and were like sisters. Hannah was also a housemaid and lived with her mother in a cottage in Erdington Green. Mary spent a lot of time at Hannah's home, and she was also close to Hannah's mom, Mrs. Butler. That Sunday night, the girls were excited about the Wit Suntide dance at the Tyburn House Inn. Mary had bought new shoes and a new dress, a beautiful white creation that suited her perfectly. Mary and Hannah were happy as they got ready for the dance. They left Mrs. Butler's cottage between 7 and 8 p.m., up Bell Lane, then turned into Holly Lane, then Chester Road. The dance at Tyburn House was not a grand ball or anything out of a Jane Austen novel, rather a jolly get-together with workers, such as farmhands and housemaids. At the dance, Mary had a great time and was seen spending most of the evening in the company of a 24-year-old bricklayer called Abraham Thornton. He knew her sister and was interested in getting to know Mary better. Abraham did not have the best reputation, but that did not put Mary off. She was intrigued by this man's man. He was nearly six feet tall, with a thick neck and tree trunks for legs. At the time, the language used to describe him said he had a reputation for laddishness and was given to boasting and lewd talk. In today's world, he would perhaps be a stereotypical overconfident, loudmouthed frat boy. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. How does the offer of free beer sound to you? All you need to do is go to www.beer52.com forward slash evidence and cover just £4.95 for the postage. As an added bonus to our listeners, sign up within the next two weeks and get two extra for free. So that's a total of 10 free beers. Beer 52 is like the evidence locker of beer. While we bring you true crime stories from around the world, they traverse the globe to find the best beer from the greatest small batch breweries Planet Earth has to offer. Each month, Beer 52 deliver a case with a different theme. Let your palate travel to Germany, Korea, Norway, or California. I might just kick back and listen to our Black Metal Mayhem episode while trying a new Norwegian craft beer after recording this episode. Go to www.beer52.com forward slash evidence to get your first case of beers for free. And don't forget, sign up in the next two weeks and get an extra two unmissable beers free. That's www.beer52.com forward slash evidence. Now back to today's episode. Like Mary, Abraham Thornton also lived in the Erdington area. His father was a builder, and although the family was not wealthy by any means, they lived in a large farmhouse, and they were in a position to employ servants. Hannah spent her night talking to her sister and dancing with her fiancé, a local farmer called Benjamin Carter. The dance ended at midnight, and Hannah found Mary, still in Abraham's company. Hannah said that it was time to go, and they all left together. Hannah, Benjamin, Mary, and Abraham. When they reached a fork in the road, outside another pub called Old Cuckoo, the group split up. Mary said that she was going to sleep at her grandfather's house in Bell Lane, as it was closer to work in the morning. Hannah frowned, as she knew Mary's work clothes was still back at her mom's house, but she didn't say anything, as she sensed that Mary was not yet ready to say goodnight to Abraham. Abraham offered to walk Mary to her grandfather's house. Hannah veered off and went home while Benjamin walked up ahead of Mary and Abraham, in the direction of his home. At 3 a.m., a local man called John Humphage saw Abraham Thornton and a woman in white standing on Penn's Lane. He saw them at a stile, that is, some steps that go over a fence so pedestrians can cross, but livestock would stay inside a field. When John walked past, Abraham greeted him, but the woman looked down, and John could see she was preoccupied with her skirt, trying to tuck it behind her. John immediately assumed that the two young people had had improper relations, a passionate role in the hay, so to speak so went on his way to avoid any further awkwardness. The location of the style where John saw Mary and Abraham was quite a way north from Hannah's home. 
But with the next eyewitness testimony, it is fair to assume Mary went straight to Hannah's after the encounter with John Humphage. At 3.30 a.m., Mary was seen walking towards Mrs. Butler's cottage at Erdington Green. She was alone and walking at a slow pace. She arrived at Mrs. Butler's cottage and called outside Hannah's window for her friend to let her in. Hannah looked at her mother's wind-up clock and noted that it was 4.40 a.m. Once inside, Mary changed out of her party dress, back into her working clothes, as it was almost time to clock in for work. She told Hannah that she had spent the night, literally a couple of hours, at her grandfather's house. Then she asked Hannah to come around to Langley Heath to see her later in the day, which was not unusual as the two would often meet up in the day. Before she left, Mary pulled a comb through her hair, laughed, and said, Don't I look like a rake. Hannah said that Mary was in a hurry to get to her uncle's home before he left to go to the market in Birmingham. She was rushed, but did not seem anxious in the least. When Mary left 20 minutes later, she was wearing her new white shoes and carried the party dress and the half boots she had left at Hannah's the day before in her arms. After that, two witnesses saw her in Bell Lane, walking alone. And that was the last time Mary was ever seen alive. At 6.30 a.m. on Monday, the 26th of May, 1817, a laborer named George Jackson was on his way to work at Penn's Mill when he saw a bundle of clothes with a woman's blood-stained half-boots. At that moment, he noticed 40-year-old William Lavelle, who lived in the worker's cottage closest to the scene. Lavelle was coming out the front door as he was on his way to work. Jackson told him about his odd discovery, and the men went back to where the clothing was bundled on the ground. Jackson saw some drops of blood on the ground, and a bit farther away, a larger puddle of blood, which he referred to as a large lake of blood near a tree. From the pool of blood, the men followed a zigzag trail that took them to a water pit. Afraid of what they were about to discover, the men agreed that Lavelle would stay at the location while Jackson went to nearby Penn's Mill to get help. At the mill, he found a couple of colleagues who were just starting the day's work, and they all went back to the field with him. One man ran to inform their boss, Joseph Webster, the owner of Penn's Mill. Back at the scene, several men climbed down the flooded sand pit, where they found a female body. They fetched a heel rake to pull the body out of the pit. Just before 8 a.m., they finally managed to pull the body out. It was a woman wearing a pink dress and a red spencer, which is a short jacket. Mud covered her face, and there was a trickle of blood coming from her nose. There was a lot of blood on her dress, between her thighs, and on her shoes. William Lavelle immediately recognized her as Mary Ashford. He remembered seeing her only hours before at the dance at Tyburn House. Jackson did not want to risk getting into trouble at work, so he left at this point. Before he left, he had a good look at footprints in the freshly plowed field and agreed with Lavelle that there were no footprints matching Mary's shoes anywhere near the flooded pit. They made the conclusion that she was thrown into it. It would take a while for law enforcement to arrive, as the closest constable was in Birmingham and had been sent for. In the chaos of the moment, William Lavelle took it upon himself to investigate the scene. He went to the public footpath which crossed the field diagonally, but could not find any footprints that looked like they were made by the small boots found beside the pit. He was able to find footprints around the edge of the field, however. There were two sets of footprints, smaller ones and larger ones, sunken into the ground, giving the impression that it was made by a heavy-set man. Near the pool of blood, just off the footpath was a patch of sand with many footprints. There had quite obviously been a scuffle. On the other side of the pit, on the steep bank, Lavelle noticed a single footprint made by a man's left foot. It was fair to assume the killer had stepped onto the bank to steady himself as he disposed of his victim. Then, crossing the field towards the Castle Bromwich Road, the footprints changed, like the person who made them was running away from the pit. From the footprints, a theory about Mary's last moments alive emerged. It appeared that Mary was chased by a man, raped, then thrown into the pit. Once she was dead, the man ran away. At this point, owner of Penn's Mill, Joseph Webster, arrived. He was of a higher social standing than Lavelle, so he took charge. He sent some men to fetch a door that was off its hinges at the mill to serve as a stretcher. He also sent for the magistrate, William Bedford, who lived in Birch's Green, south of Erdington. 
Lavelle showed him the footprints and Webster agreed that it was of great significance. Webster told Lavelle to cover the prints with boards so the evidence would not be compromised once police and other onlookers arrived. Among the onlookers who gathered was Mary's brother, William Ashford. He stood in shock and disbelief as he saw the men from Penn's Mill and other villagers take charge of the murder scene. Everyone was too busy to even realize he was there. They carried Mary's body on the door and took her to William Lavelle's cottage. His wife Fanny stepped in and washed Mary's body, preparing for the coroner's arrival. Mary Smith, a friend of Fanny's, came to help her. The first thing Mary Smith noticed was that the victim's body was not yet cold. The women worked meticulously to remove all the layers of Mary's clothes, a spencer, a dress, an underdress, a skirt, and detachable pockets. Mary was small, only 5 foot 4 or 1.6 meters, and of slender build. Both ladies said that it was clear to them that Mary was on her period, but she was not prepared as she did not wear a menstrual cloth as was customary at the time. Dr. George Freer and Coroner Francis Bain and Hackett performed the post-mortem examination in William and Fanny Lavelle's cottage. They concluded that Mary's cause of death was drowning, as there was duckweed in her stomach, the same duckweed found in the pit where her body was discovered. This meant that Mary was still alive when she was thrown into the water. She was wearing many layers of clothing, and there was a lot of blood between her thighs. Her hymen had been ruptured, showing that she lost her virginity that night. The coroner also noted bruises on her arms, above the elbow, that looked like it was made by the fingers from a large hand. The conclusion was that she was raped, and that she was on her period, because there were two types of blood on Mary's thighs. It was difficult to ascertain how much of the blood was from her period and how much came from her injuries. The doctor did feel that the puddle of blood in the field was not menstrual blood, however, which meant that her injuries were quite severe. There were lacerations on her vagina. The autopsy concluded that the injuries were recent, but neither Dr. Freer nor Coroner Hackett had any idea what had caused it. The owner of the Tyburn house, Daniel Clark, heard about Mary's death and remembered that he saw her leave with Abraham Thornton the night before. He immediately went to look for Abraham and asked him if he knew what had happened to Mary. When Abraham Thornton was told about Mary's death, he was shocked. He said, I cannot believe she is murdered. Why, I was with her until four o'clock this morning. Abraham went willingly with Daniel Clark back to Tyburn House to talk with Constable Thomas Dales in order to clear himself of any suspicion. In the interview, Constable Dales noticed that Thornton had blood on the cuff of his shirt. When he asked him about it, Thornton explained that he had been concerned with a girl, but with her consent. She had told him that she was not fit, meaning she was on her period, but he had said that he didn't mind. Constable Dales would later testify about Thornton's story, that he had sex with Mary, but he did not write it in the official statement. When asked why, he said that he believed Thornton when he said it was consensual and did not want to upset Mary's family any further by reporting the details of how Mary spent her last hours alive. Thornton's shoes were taken off of him and sent to the scene of the murder where Lavelle and helpers compared it to the footprints in the Harrowed Field. It was exactly the same size. However, the shape did not match 100%. The footprints in the mud were quite shapeless, whereas the soles on Thornton's shoes were cut in precise left and right shapes. But then there was a nail lodged into the front of Thornton's right shoe, a distinctive anomaly that was consistent with a mark on the footprints. Abraham Thornton was completely confused when he was arrested later that same day and swore that he was innocent. He was kept in remand while the magistrate built a case against him, with some help from the Erdington community. Firstly, Magistrate William Bedford went to speak to Hannah Cox. Hannah Cox was understandably shaken up, but she tried to help as best she could. She told him about Mary's brief visit in the pre-dawn hours and said that she did not get the sense that anything was wrong. Remember, Hannah was Mary's best friend and they had known each other all their lives. If something was bothering Mary, Hannah would definitely have picked up on it. Hannah made it clear that Mary was a virgin and that she would not have slept with someone as a one-night stand out in the field. Hannah was also sure that if Mary had somehow succumbed to temptation, she would definitely have told her. This did not make Thornton look all that good. Most people were convinced that they were dealing with a case of sexual assault rather than consensual sex. Abraham Thornton stuck to his original story, admitting that he did have consensual sex with Mary, 
but he denied assaulting and killing her. He made it clear that after they had said goodbye to Hannah and Benjamin, they walked hand in hand over a field and went to sit down on a stile to chat. He said that Mary never went to her grandfather's house that night. She had lied to Hannah, probably because she was ashamed of him taking liberties with her. He said that he offered to walk her to Mrs. Butler's cottage in Erdington Green. They walked for a while, then he had to relieve himself. Mary walked ahead, and he never caught up with her again. He waited outside Hannah's place for a couple of minutes, but when Mary did not come out, he left to go home. Witnesses saw him waiting for her, and also saw him walking home when he said he did. A gamekeeper called John Hayden even stopped and talked to him for 15 minutes. At 4.30 a.m., a milkman named William Jennings saw him. Three other witnesses also saw him walking alone. Law enforcement could not find any evidence that Abraham saw Mary again that morning. Owner of Penn's Mill, Joseph Webster, realized that it was essential to establish a timeline of events. Back in the early 19th century, time was mainly determined by a single source in a village like a clock tower or a church bell. Law clocks had to be wound up, and more often than not, they either ran too slow or too fast. At best, clocks were used to estimate time. Webster went on a mission to check the time of all the witnesses' clocks, and matching it to their testimonies. He himself had a pocket watch, which was set to Birmingham time, and used that as a guideline. His research set the timeline as such. Mary, Hannah, Benjamin, and Abraham Thornton left Tyburn House at midnight. This was a fixed time as it was when the party was officially over and guests were asked to leave. They parted ways about half past twelve at the Old Cuckoo. Mary went with Abraham Thornton out of her free will. They walked over a field and stopped at a stile. Presumably, they mostly talked, and Thornton tried his luck, but was rebuffed. That was when the awkward encounter with John Humpage happened, when Mary looked down and tucked her skirt behind her. From there, Mary went to Hannah's mother's cottage. Hannah first said that Mary arrived at 4.40 on her mother's clock and left just about 5 a.m., but witnesses saw Hannah walking away from Hannah's home before 4.30. Joseph Webster was able to establish that the clock in Mrs. Butler's cottage was slow, and that Mary actually arrived at 4 a.m. and left 4.20 a.m., which is when she was spotted in Bell Lane. At the same time, 4.30, Thornton was seen by multiple witnesses. At 10 minutes to 5, Thornton was seen near the floodgates, having a conversation with gamekeeper John Hayden. Webster was also able to confirm that George Jackson passed by the scene closer to 6 a.m., not 6.30, as he had originally stated. This complicated things, because you see, Thornton was engaged in conversation with no rush to head off anywhere at 5 a.m. He was two miles away from Mary's body, which was found an hour later. On average, it would take someone about 30 minutes to walk two miles. That would mean, even if Thornton ran... He would have had to find Mary, sexually assault her, render her unconscious, and throw her body into a pit in less than half an hour. Of course, this is not impossible, but witnesses who saw him at the floodgates felt it was implausible as he was in a relaxed mood, heading home, and greeting every passerby. They did not think that he was in the state of mind to have committed the crime that he was being accused of, the charge of willful murder, as the coroner concluded that they could not say for certain whether Mary was raped or not. The story was big news at the time. The Birmingham Gazette reported that a respectable young female had been found murdered near Penn's Mill and that a young man of respectable connections had been arrested. That was a polite attempt to protect the dignity of both the victim and the suspect. Abraham Thornton's trial was held on the 8th of August, 1817, three months after Mary's murder, at the periodic court in Warwick. A crowd gathered from sunrise in front of the courthouse. They believed Thornton was guilty and wanted to see justice done. Prosecution's theory was that after Mary shot Thornton down, he returned to the field and waited for her, as he knew she would cross the field to get to work. He forced himself on her, strangled her, and then threw her into the pit where she drowned. Thornton's defense attorney, Edward Sadler, called 11 witnesses to construct an exact alibi for Thornton. He also refuted the footprint allegations. He posed the possibility that the footprints were made before the sexual encounter earlier that evening. 
He pointed out that Mary was happy and chatty when she arrived at Hannah's home in the early morning hours. She did not appear like someone who had been violated or raped. She was on a high. She was happy. After six minutes' deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict of not guilty, and Thornton was free to go. His acquittal caused an outrage in the community, and they raised funds to support Mary's brother when he said that he wanted to appeal the verdict. At the time, English law allowed the family of a victim to appeal against a verdict. The retrial took place on the 17th of November, 1817, this time at the Court of the King's Bench in London. It was a sensational crime, and all of Britain followed the story in the newspapers. Despite strong community support, William Ashford did not really succeed in building a stronger case against Thornton. In court proceedings, when Thornton was asked to enter his plea, he said, Not guilty and I am ready to defend the same with my body. He then threw a gauntlet onto the floor, in the center of the courtroom. There was a moment of confusion in court that was cleared up when defense attorney Edward Sadler explained Thornton wished to have trial by battle. Lord Chief Justice Ellenborough allowed Thornton to choose this archaic option. Trial by battle came into common UK law shortly after the Norman invasion of England in 1066. It went out of practice around the 16th century, and at the time of Thornton's trial, it had not been used for over 200 years. What Thornton meant by throwing the gauntlet down was that he was challenging William Ashford to a physical fight for justice. He was prepared to profess his innocence, even if it could cost him his life. The men would be taken to a public square where they would both be given a wooden stave, and then they would attack each other. The only way out, other than death, was to surrender or if one became incapacitated during the duel. If Thornton won, he would be a free man. If he surrendered to William, he would be executed. He would literally be taken from the spot and hanged on the same day. If the sun set and both men were undefeated, Thornton would be free. Prosecution protested, but Lord Ellenborough made it clear that it was a rightful option within English law at the time. However, William Ashford was not quite the fighting type. A description of him said that he was a plain country young man, about 22 years of age, of short stature, sandy hair, and blue eyes. Abraham Thornton, on the other hand, was a burly 20-something bricklayer. It was obvious that Thornton would win in a physical fight, which meant William Ashford was in danger of losing his life. By the end of April in the following year, Ashford had yet to respond to Thornton's challenge. The court ruled that Ashford surrendered, and that all charges against Thornton were dropped. But the damage was done. Back in Erdington, Thornton was despised. Everybody felt that he was guilty and that he had gotten away with murder. During his trial, a witness testified that on the night of Mary's murder, he had overheard Thornton boasting to a friend that he had had sex with her sister three times before and that he was going to have Mary too, or die for it. This enraged the community who knew that the Ashford sisters were good girls who would not sleep around. After the trial, Thornton could not find work, as nobody wanted to employ an accused murderer. He decided to emigrate to America, but even that proved to be challenging. When fellow passengers on the ship to the U.S. learned about his past, they refused to sail with him. He was then asked to disembark by the captain of the ship before the ship left the U.K., He did eventually make it to New York, where he married and lived a prosperous life. In 1819, the law was changed to exclude the retrial request by a family member, as well as the notion of trial by battle. To this day, the murder of Mary Ashford remains unsolved. Thornton is still the most likely suspect. As for Mary, she was laid to rest in the churchyard of Sutton Coldfield. Her headstone bears the inscription, As a warning to female virtue and a humble monument to female chastity, this stone marks the grave of Mary Ashford, who on the twentieth year of her age, having incautiously repaired to a scene of amusement without proper protection, was brutally murdered on the 27th of May, 1817. Rumors milled around town that perhaps Mary had ended her own life, as she felt guilty about losing her virginity to Abraham Thornton. But there was absolutely no evidence to support this theory. Mary Ashford's murder would probably have been forgotten, but when another murder occurred in Erdington, her case came back to haunt investigators. The cases bore many similarities, but there was no way they could be connected 
as 157 years had passed since Mary's murder in 1817. In 1974, Barbara Forrest was raped and strangled and left to die at Pipe Hayes Park. The exact location of her body was only 300 yards from where Mary's body was found all those years ago. Barbara had disappeared after a night out on the town with her boyfriend. He last saw her at the Colmore Circus bus stop where she was supposed to take the bus home. But Barbara never made it home. Her body was found more than a week later. Barbara's mother, Marguerite, said, She was a wonderful girl. This is the sort of thing you hear of happening but never think it can happen to you. More than 100 law enforcement officers were involved in the investigation. They went door to door in a massive effort to find information. Posters were everywhere, pleading with the public for information. They even staged and filmed a reconstruction with a female police officer dressed in a similar outfit to the one Barbara wore when she was found, getting off the bus in the early hours of the morning and walking home. But even that yielded no significant results. Also, police could not find any witnesses who could place Barbara on the number 67 bus on the night she disappeared. They could not say for certain if she got onto the bus in the first place. Because of this, two theories were constructed. Firstly, that Barbara was abducted from the bus stop at Colmore Circus, or that she accepted a ride from someone she knew who then turned out to be her killer. The second theory was that Barbara was taken moments after she got off the bus. It was a 10-minute walk from the Tyburn bus stop to her home. She could have been taken as she was walking. Police had to approach both areas around the bus stops as possible crime scenes. A witness came forward and said that at the time of Barbara's disappearance, he saw a blue car parked on the road near Pipe Hayes Park that seemed out of place. It was the first piece of the puzzle that led them to a suspect. In September 1974, police arrested a 38-year-old child care officer who was a colleague of Barbara's at the children's home and lived on Chester Road with his mother. His name was Michael Ian Thornton. Police found bloodstains on his pants and his alibi for the time of the murder was later proved to be false. It was provided by his mother, who had lied to protect her son. Michael Thornton stood trial for Barbara's murder in March 1975, but was acquitted. The reason for his acquittal was that the case against him was mainly circumstantial. To this day, Barbara's murder is unsolved. The biggest difference between the two cases probably has to do with the discovery of the bodies. Mary's body was found on the day that she was murdered. However, with a more populated Erdington that had become a part of Birmingham by 1974, it took more than a week to find Barbara's body. There are certainly more similarities than discrepancies in these cases. And the parallels between the murders of Mary Ashford and Barbara Forrest have kept both cases alive somehow. Both women were 20 years old when they were murdered. Looking at a sketch of Mary Ashford and a photo of Barbara Forrest, one cannot deny a strong resemblance between the two. Both had fair skins, similar facial features, and dark brown hair. And unbelievably, the two victims even shared a birthday. Some people believe that the probability theory called the birthday paradox, or the birthday problem, offers an explanation about the similarities between two incidents. It's the idea that, if there were 23 people in a room, there is a 50-50 chance that two of them would share the same birthday. In a room with 75 people, there is a 99% chance of two people having the same date of birth. It's not that improbable that two people living in the same neighborhood, albeit more than 150 years apart, would have the same birthday. The same counts for the day of a person's death. Mary and Barbara went dancing on a Sunday night, the 26th of May the night before Whit Monday. Whit Monday is a shifting holiday and its date changes every year in relation to Easter. Both Mary and Barbara were killed in the early morning hours of Monday, the 27th of May. They were raped and strangled, and their bodies were left in the same area, only a couple of yards apart. Shortly before her murder, Mary Ashford said to her friend Hannah's mom that she had bad feelings about the week to come. Ten days before her murder, Barbara Forrest also had a premonition that something bad was about to happen to her. She told a friend at work, This is going to be my unlucky month. I just know it. Don't ask me why. And in both cases, a man with the last name of Thornton was arrested and later acquitted. 
Both Mary and Barbara's siblings refused to give up and insisted on retrials. In Mary's case, William Ashford was the one who pushed for a retrial. In Barbara's case, it was her sister Erica. In 2012, Barbara's family urged authorities to have another look at Barbara's case. If they could look at DNA from the case, perhaps they could solve the case for good. However, police said that there were no further forensic opportunities to explore in the 40-year-old cold case. Barbara's family remembers samples being taken and stored at the time of her death, but they suspect that the evidence has either gone missing or has become compromised over the years. However, police have not confirmed or denied this suspicion. Sadly, the uncanny resemblance between the two murders meant that it became the defining factor for both cases. With all the witnesses and evidence from the Mary Ashford case no longer surviving, chances are her case will be forever unsolved. However, there should still be a chance to close Barbara Forrest's murder case and afford her family some respite. We'd like to thank today's sponsors, Beer52. Don't forget to claim your free beer at www.beer52.com forward slash evidence. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate if you could review the episodes as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.